This is Beyond a Reasonable Doubt with your hosts, Mark Garrigus and Gary Smith. Wow. Gary, who would have thought uh, maybe 24 hours ago, uh, Alec Baldwin was the biggest uh, news around, at least in our little bubble. And uh, what a difference uh, 18 hours makes, huh? Yeah, it's uh, these pesky 20 year olds. They just uh, they throw the news cycle for a loop. Yeah, it's something. I, you know, there's reporting now uh, or there has been uh, interesting when they did the press conference yesterday about uh, in Pennsylvania. They had the FBI agent who was the SAC special agent in charge of the uh, uh, Pennsylvania State Police and the the local police there, they weren't identified. Uh, uh, it kind of shows you the difference, the the difference uh, in the worlds as we uh, look at it. I I was looking at my phone and they had already reported and it was already all over the internet, so to speak, as to who the uh, shooter was. Uh, yet in the press conference that was being carried live, they were doing it and saying we haven't 100 percent identified and sure enough uh, the person who was identified had um, uh, at least on the internet uh, at least an hour before uh, uh, turns out to be the person that was killed by the secret service yeah it makes you realize that we just don't have enough time on reasonable doubt each week to uh, cover all the new the news of the day because we haven't covered you know the debate the subsequent biden press conference and now all of a sudden we have this to contend with it's been uh, a roller coaster of a few weeks to say the least yeah um so we do have and we i suppose we can do our um uh, Alec Baldwin wrap up, so to speak, uh, for those who weren't paying attention, he was in the middle of trial. Basically what happened in the middle of trial is I believe on Thursday on cross examination by, I think it was Alex Spiro who was doing the cross. It became apparent that there was a, uh, ammunition that had been turned in on the day that Anna Gutierrez Reed was convicted by a uh, person who was friends with Anna Gutierrez Reed's stepfather, as I understand the genealogy, right. who is a very well known, well respected armor. On the day of the conviction, he took over a um, either a box or a uh, container of some ammunition and by all accounts he's the reason that she got the job he has a long history in hollywood and very 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 well respected and has a you know a lot of a lot of friends in the industry and that's sort of how she ended up landing this gig and apparently one of his friends he, uh, the person you were talking about is her stepfather and one of his friends on the day she was convicted took over some ammunition because he thought that he had an explanation for what had happened. You will remember, I maybe not, there when this happened or this tragedy happened originally, there was a suggestion that somebody had intentionally sabotaged the set. Yeah. And that was to for lack of a better term, poo pooed and um said that was ridiculous. But as it turns out, there is somebody that uh, arguably could have been uh, or supplied a live ammunition that looked like the dummies. And that is why on the day she was convicted, this person is presumably bringing that to the authorities, the law enforcement, and saying, hey, wait a second here, you should look at this. Now, what ended up developing is that the they checked that ammunition in that was delivered on the day that Anna Gutierrez Reed was convicted under a different case number, not under her case number or the joint case number or the case number of uh, Alec Baldwin, but a completely separate standalone case number. And Subsequent to that happening, within a very short period of time, because I believe that was in April and then later in April and May, the defense 
of Alec Baldwin asks for a showing of all the evidence, which is a common practice where you go as a defense lawyer, you visit, they bring all the evidence out, you take a look at it, because arguably they don't want to ruin chain of custody. They want to be able to uh, say that it never left the location. And the defense wants to be able to look and take a look and say, arguably, I want to test this, I want to test that, or and, and do those kinds of things. Ironically, the hearing this week on Scott Peterson revolves around that very issue, that same issue. This issue um, uh, it comes to fruition because they go, they take a look, and lo and behold, they're not shown this late-breaking disclosure. Now, fast forward to the trial. They've They've already, mind you, you may remember this, they've already once asked that this case be dismissed because... He was originally indicted, P. Alec Baldwin, on a count that was not the law at the time the offense occurred. So that count got dismissed. It was also dismissed once again when they destroyed the gun with the mallet, and for which is a uh, arguably a trombetta issue. And so against that backdrop, it's now discovered that there's a separate case number where they've got this evidence, which they waited until trial and reluctantly disclosed. The morning of Friday, one of the prosecutors who in fact had special counsel prosecutor resigns. And there's the last person standing, there's a litany, if you watch some of the videos, there's a litany of people who have resigned during this prosecution. And the last, or at least titular head of this prosecution, Morrissey, is the last person standing. And it, there's a back and forth with the judge and with this other witness who was cross-examined. And the judge comes off the bench. She examines the evidence, is asking some very probing questions. You have some video of some of this, I think, don't you? Uh, I do. It's a little long here, so you're going to have to call your own out on uh, when when you're done with it. But let me see if I can get this up here. It's right here. Necessary, Frank. Do you want to make argument? Further argument. Nope. All right. I don't think either side needs further argument. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's stop for one second. So that's Spyro, that's uh, Alec Baldwin, that's uh, Luke Nickus, and then Morrissey is the uh, woman sitting at the council table or getting ready to sit at the council table on the right. I don't know why I can't get over Baldwin's glasses. It seems like he found the biggest glasses he could find for someone his age to make him look smart. It, I, I don't know. It's, something, it's the only thing I've been taking away from this trial. I've been watching a lot of the videos, and every single time I'm bumped by how big and thick his glasses are, but... Yeah, that's just me. Yeah, but well, the, you go for his glasses, Spyro's collar, shirt collars are what always get me, but go on. So, dismissal with prejudice is a very extreme sanction. And uh, case law is very clear that um, because it's uh, very extreme, I have to go through every single element and I have to make a very good record as to what, why I'm I'm seeing what I'm seeing. So in order Hold to on. establish a Brady. Okay. So she's now going to give the reasons for the dismissal. Somebody had asked me do, as this was happening or at, right before, what would she do? And I said, well, my my immediate reaction is she should dismiss it, but it is a drastic sanction because jeopardy is attached there. If she dismisses it, and I know she says with prejudice, but clearly a dismissal where jeopardy attaches and you don't consent to the declaration of a mistrial, with the exception of Oregon v. Kennedy, that is once in jeopardy, you're done. So she's making a record. She's going through the record of Brady, uh, the Brady violation and the Jiglio violation to hat to, to my dog. Yeah, leave your dogs out of this, Mark. Yeah, exactly. And by the way, one of the things that this prosecutor, we don't have the tape, had made the argument, she was blaming law enforcement 
Um, and it, it, I was remarking to somebody uh, yesterday as well, the idea that you would blame law enforcement on a Brady Jiglio violation when you are a lawyer is embarrassing because there is another case, Kyles v. Whitley, which says not only do you not get to blame other people, but you can expand the prosecution team for purpose of Brady disclosure to uh, Kyle's. It was the coroner um, uh, or the um, uh, part of the team. And in, in California, we've got a case in I think it's in Ray Brown, where uh, in Orange County, they had a similar uh, situation. So uh, where it was part of the team. So that does it's the last refuge of a scoundrel to go and blame your team. It is on you and this judge had found and i believe the the cross-examination revealed that the prosecutor who i'd mentioned morrissey had discussed it and knew and had not disclosed yeah watchers of news news nation will uh recognize that uh particular line of questioning as well because uh the the prosecutor who you're referring to made that point herself on a uh, recent episode of chris cuomo's show yeah she went on in fact, I followed her on the show. She went on with Cuomo and uh, and disclosed that the the testimony that this prosecutor, the last woman standing, who actually is at the ground zero of this misconduct, she testified that she believed that the reason the prosecutor, her co-counsel, uh, who was intimately involved, gave the opening, as I said, resigned. She said because she didn't want a public hearing. And I, do we have that where she rebuts that? We don't, but it's good video. I'll, I'll get it for next week. She's, uh, you know, it's it's very refreshing, her appearance on Cuomo. She is um, wildly, seems wildly credible and the kind of person that you would uh, you would want working on the uh, prosecution side if anyone who you uh, cared about was on the other side of the table. Well, and she understands the duty of a prosecutor. You've heard me say it a thousand times. The duty of the prosecutor is zealous advocacy, but at the same time, it's not to convict, it's to do justice. And that prosecutor resigned rather than go forward with a hearing and contest and basically kick it over to the judge. And, you know, it reminds me of what one of my father's constant complaints about DAs is it's always easier to let the judge do your dirty work. It's always easier to let the judge do it so that you don't have to stand up and do your job. And that uh, basically is why this prosecutor resigned. She wasn't going to force the force or voice this upon the judge. She wanted the uh, the prosecution to stand up and dismiss and to admit that they had, that there were shenanigans going on here. Yeah. And you have said that time and time again, and it is always, you know, factual when we hear it out of you, but it is refreshing to hear it out of someone who was on the other side of the table and absolutely, you know, just laid down their sword and gave up their job as a result of something they felt was unjust. It was just wildly, wildly refreshing. Yeah. Just uh, And so what the judge is doing now, because it's a drastic remedy, going back to what I was texting with the producer, what the prosecution was arguing is you could just give a curative jury instruction. You could just say the prosecution dropped the ball, blah, blah, blah. It's up to you, the jury, to decide the import of that. But there's a uh, presumption that they uh, acted in bad faith. This judge was having none of it. None of it. Seeing what I'm seeing. So... In order to establish a Brady violation, the defendant must show that the prosecution suppressed evidence, the evidence was favorable to the accused, and the evidence was material to the defense. So let's go through the elements. Suppression of evidence. The definition of suppression of elements, this is Case versus Hatch, is while the first element requires proof that the prosecution suppressed or withheld the evidence in question, it does not require a finding of bad faith or any other culpable state of mind on the part of the prosecutor. This prong is satisfied. The Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office and the prosecution failed to disclose the supplemental report to defense and provide defense an opportunity to inspect the rounds collected into evidence that Mr. Teske gave. Is the evidence favorable to the accused? The second Brady element is whether the suppressed evidence was favorable to the accused, either as impeachment or exculpatory evidence. This prong is satisfied. 
The suppressed evidence is favorable to the accused. It is impeachment evidence, has even been offered in this trial as impeachment evidence, and is potentially exculpatory to the defense. Critically, the exculpatory value cannot be analyzed at such a late juncture because of the non-disclosure. Is the evidence material? While well, post-trial discovery of evidence under Brady requires a reasonable probability that the result of the proceeding would have been different, discovery of evidence during trial requires an evaluation of whether the late tender has impeded the effective use of evidence in such a way that it impacts the fundamental fairness of the proceedings, and that is uh, State versus Huerta Cost Castro. This evidence is material. The late discovery of this evidence during trial has impeded the effective use of evidence in such a way that it has impacted the fundamental fairness of the proceedings. The yeah, defense is not in a position. She So she's making the findings that she has to make, but it's interesting because the case she just cited, I went back and looked at it because it struck me that it was not, that was a case where they actually tendered the evidence, where the prosecution kind of did an affirmative, oh, we just discovered this. This one was the defense having to extract it. One of the things, and I know we're, we've gone long and I'm, I've got to jump on a light, but one of the things that, uh, I react to immediately is it's hard to believe Hannah Gutierrez Reed is in custody. Uh, I don't think she will be for much longer. She should yeah. certainly shouldn't be. Um, her lawyer, you know, if he hasn't done it already, he should run in there. I mean, this happened to me a couple of years ago. I did a cross examination in the middle of trial and uh, of a witness who was in custody. And I kind of got the witness to concede a, our theory. And I turned to his lawyer who was sitting in the uh, audience and I said, if you aren't making a motion right now to get your client out, then I, uh, then you, you should turn in your bar card. He did it that next week and the client got out, of, his client got out of custody. Um, in this case, you know, that lawyer should run into court. I, I saw some quotes, but, you know, uh, that person should be, uh, she should be out of custody, should have been out of custody the minute the mistrial was declared, number one. Number two, interestingly, uh, what a difference a judge makes. Can you imagine, we've watched the Karen Reed case, okay? Can you imagine if you had this judge presiding over the Karen Reed case uh, and the shenanigans in that case, arguably of much bigger stakes, even, even though they're both homicide cases. So the one criticism I'll give to Alex Spiro in his opening saying it's not a homicide. Um, uh, the, um, the fact that that judge in the Karen Reed case didn't have the, um, the, I won't say what, but it didn't have the DNA, the, the DNA to do what was right. And I will give you one other um, uh, case. Uh, there's well, I won't even get into it. But uh, Stephen Baldwin, this is not the first case that Stephen Baldwin has sat in a courtroom, <laughs> probably is PTSD about a uh, another uh, judge that uh, he's watched when there's shenanigans. It's unfortunate, but that's where we are to get judges who do their job. And she did her job. Uh, I invite you, maybe Gary, I'll put the YouTube link to that. Um, uh, what was that long crime network? Yeah. That uh, was showing it. It's an int It's a watcher and watch the analysis. It's fascinating. And she did exactly what was right. Uh, if this had happened in one of the aforementioned cases, I could have seen a judge saying, no, no, no. You know, this goes to weight, not admissibility. I mean, they would have given you a million excuses and they would have just given at best a curative instruction. So kudos to her for doing the right thing. Yeah. Judge Mary Marlowe Summer, I will say, if nothing else, she was a lot more measured than the uh, the judge we've been following in the in the uh, Karen Reed case. That's I, I don't think arguable. Yeah, exactly. Well, Gary, thank you. We we did it a little early today. I appreciate you being uh, uh, very agreeable as always. Uh, 
Did we? I did. I send you a merch of the week. You sure didn't. And Mark, I, I haven't had a chance to speak to you much in person recently, so we'll just go ahead and do it on the air. I think we might have to do another merch order because we are down to uh, smalls and f- two or three mediums, and that's it. We've uh, we've given away all of our merch. Okay, so this is where a new rule. How's that? New rule is on your comment. If you if you are if it's designed for merch. Remember, right now, this week, you got to put an S or an M. Is that right? There you go. Yeah, that's, I believe, what we have left. Not what you might normally think S and M stands for, but an S for a small or an M for a medium next to your comment so that if we pick you, we know that uh, you can do it. Because I don't want to get a lot of flack from somebody who says I'm an extra large and I got a small. Yeah, well, uh, those people can go ahead and send their comments to Engine because uh, we've had some staff members who thought the merch was good looking and uh, may have may have taken some liberties. So we'll uh, we'll probably do another order here soon and we'll we'll restock. But uh, until then, small and medium is all we got left. You got it. Thanks, Gary. I appreciate it. Have a great week. Thanks, Mark. You as well. Bye bye. Safe travels. Thanks for listening to Reasonable Doubt. Subscribe on YouTube at YouTube.com slash Reasonable Doubt Podcast.